Hey everyone, Harry here to talk about Josh Steinglass's closing argument for the people, uh, the district attorney, who, by the way, uh, Alvin Bragg, uh, the district attorney himself, was in the courtroom today for the prosecution urging uh, a guilty vote. Um, let's start with a few general impressions. Um, it was long. It was arguably too long. It it went until 8 p.m. Uh, when court normally adjourns at 4.30. But um, the jurors really wanted to finish off. It struck me as possible that Steinglass was playing for going over into tomorrow because there's a certain advantage to having the jury sleep on what he'd said so far and then really come out of the box with a final, you know, half hour kind of peroration uh, uh, driving the main points home. But anyway, the jury wanted to stay. And um, Merchan, the judge, actually, uh, was he's, he's really an impressive, uh, impressive judge, but he's especially impressive running the courtroom calmly but firmly. But anyway, he said, I've been watching the jurors. I think they're still there and they want to go. And they did. They had made child care arrangements and the like, and they didn't, you know, they didn't want to come back. Uh, they're coming back tomorrow for the charges, but they wanted to really finish it out. And they were focused by and large the whole time. There was one point where Steinglass said kind of volleyball coach style, can you, are you guys, can you guys go a little bit longer? And they gave him some nods and stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, in general, he was personable um and fairly likable but but that's the least of it um i haven't uh, i haven't cut to the chase yet to say it was a really excellent um summation and um anywhere between extremely solid and maybe even a sort of i wouldn't call it one for the ages but in stark contrast to um todd blanche it was completely together and to the level of the sentence, he had clearly practiced this maybe from, you know, all the way through these last few weeks. But I mean, a dozen times there was a telling moment where a, an objection was sustained and he knew in his head immediately what the next um, uh, little PowerPoint was going to be, of which there were over 100. And he I said, let's skip that one. It just showed me this guy knows it cold. Um, and it, it wasn't just that he knew. So let's start with, as I did with Blanche, kind of style points at a sentence by sentence level. It was really good. He had thought through everything he was going to say. And there were sentences that, you know, he, he wasn't overly dramatic and certainly not didn't pound the table. He's overall sort of relatively low key and, um, you know, appeals to reason, but he had thought through sentences that should combine with others or sentences that should stop in the middle or pauses. So the sweep of the closing argument was, you know, damn near exquisite. As I say, it was maybe all in all a little long, but you in stark contrast to Blanche, you always knew where he was. Uh, it was, you know, very well organized, well organized enough that he could just deliver it in a conversational way because he had practiced it, you know, that much and it was truly, um, solid. Okay. So that, you know, in, in, in style, if I've implicitly, you know, in a, in a teachery nerdy way, given Blanche what a B minus, it's an A for sure. He was really, really on his game in the moment, focused on the jury and and constructing and saying sentence after sentence that just flowed, sometimes soared a little, sometimes, you know, he had thought it all through. Okay. Content. Um, so first, I, I mentioned this with the Blanche argument where Blanche, basically, he had to say, that or he didn't have to say, but they had decided to stay to say maybe because Trump had um, demanded it that the records were true. The thirty-four pieces of paper were uh, were true, and that and that they represented an actual provision 
of legal services by Mo- Michael Cohen. And Steinglass just ate him for lunch. You know, it, it was, I mean, he, um, it, it wasn't hard given that it, it's a red, ridiculous uh submission that these were these actually represented um real work by michael cohen but it it's so clearly contradicted all the way around you know david pecker makes it clear it isn't hope hicks makes it clear it isn't mcconney makes it clear it isn't the writing the all important writing of alan weisselberg and mcconney you know they take it double it McConaughey even mentions do this for tax. I mean, it was a ludicrous um, submission that um, Blanche tried to make, and and um, Steinglass, you know, cleaned up the court with him on that. And you know, something like that. I don't think juries, by and large, say, "Oh, well, that round to prosecution, that round to the defense." You know, Blanche put it out there made a big deal and it was ridiculous. I can't believe anyone in the jury will will entertain it for more than a couple seconds and think about what that means generally about Blanche and the defense case. Okay, what else about Steinglass? He did something very effective, I thought, uh, and kind of winning, sort of charming on the uh, the this all important, well, that's one of the points he made this um October uh, 24th phone call where, in fact, um, Cohen appears to at least have talked to Schiller about a 14-year-old prank caller and then talked to Trump. That's at best. And he um, took out his watch and put it here and just simulated the call um, in a very persuasive way. He didn't rush through it. Yeah. He, how are you, buddy? Blah, blah, blah. Said, tell so-and-so. I say, hi. Listen, I got this 14 year old. Can you blah, blah, blah? Hey, can you pass me to the boss? Hey, boss, everything's okay, et cetera. 49 seconds. And it's a 90 second call. So it made it pretty, it made a pretty strong case that, that it might have been, um, both uh, talking to Schiller about the 14 year old and talking to Trump about the, uh, about Stormy Daniels. But the bigger thing is it didn't matter. He went through call after call after call. Um, where they are, where the, it's uncontradicted that, um, either, well, well, with, with, with Stormy, when the Stormy storm hits in the wake of Access Hollywood, we have calls all over Trump land, you know, multiple ones from Hicks to Cohen, uh, multiple ones from Cohen to Trump, all kinds of things with Pecker, Dylan Howard, who didn't testify, and he could just put them up, could, um, Steinglass and show them all. So the other kind of unassailable point on his part was this call on the 20th. It's just not such a big deal. And he did another very clever thing. There was some point where, um, uh, Blanche said, uh, we were the ones who introduced that, the, that evidence to you, not those guys. And Steinglass said, actually, we were the ones who did it. And Mr. Blanche was mistaken. Now, I don't think he's lying, much less committing perjury. People make mistakes, et cetera. So that was brought home as to Cohen. Um, another thing he did effectively, a sort of mid, uh, closing argument set piece about why the case matters and why it's not about you know paying off a porn star and far less uh, trump's family but it actually um was about he said look maybe you think it's not a big deal that he slept with a porn star whether that would come out or not but the main thing is this kept the people from knowing and it very he just said it and you know I, there's nothing improper with saying it but it's still kind of is uh, arresting and eyebrow raising. This could have meant the difference in the presidential election. We'll never know. But, you know, bringing it home that way really served to reinforce the importance, gravity, what prosecutors would call righteousness of the prosecution. So he did that very well. I've mentioned pretty much what he did with Cohen, but in addition, he just used the other evidence, especially Pecker and Hicks, who are really very uh, strong here in a couple ways, kind of devastating, especially Hicks. Her, you know, she says flat out that Trump says 
this was reimbursement um, for a um, a payout. So I mean, she has puts the lie just to uh, to to what Trump is saying, but she does goes a step farther and suggests Trump was lying to her because he said that Cohen uh, did it out of the goodness of his heart, and that t- did not sound like Cohen. As to Stormy, you know, Blanche had led with his chin, and he said, you, you don't have to believe they had sex. But here's what Trump said, and they had his public statements. I never met this woman except uh, once briefly on a golf course. And that was soundly rebutted by the record evidence. We know that at a minimum, Stormy Daniels came to Trump Tower one time to visit, not to mention that uh, Trump's got his her um, number in his Rolodex. So even by his own terms, it's a lie. Um, so, you know, the, the big two bites that Blanche uh, bit off were, I thought, both, you know, foolish. And um, Steinglass did an excellent do- job of, of strongly rebutting them. But all the way through, and, you know, four and a half hours, a long, a long kind of, um, a long closing, as I say, maybe a little too long, but still, he, you know, he went through the whole story from Pecker to the, uh, to, to Trump's uh, election. And with a, you know, real emphasis on how, what a total, nightmare and cataclysm it was when Stormy comes forward in the wake of the Access Hollywood tape. And again, he clobbers um, Blanche because Blanche had tried to suggest in his closing, wasn't that big a deal? Trump didn't care that much. What's the evidence of that? Oh, really nothing. I uh, I think it was um, Westerhood who didn't observe him. Hope Pips said, no, he was freaking out. Everybody was freaking out. Um, and, you know, he it's just brought home uh, and, uh, you know, very persuasively says whatever else it was for. And this dovetails exactly with what the, um, legal instruction is going to be. Um, but whatever else it was for, it was done to try to, um, mask the, a, an illegal campaign contribution. And that's maybe the last point I'll mention is, you know, as I've thought about this and analyzed it, I've thought the real advantage to the prosecution. But one thing that concerned me is whether this, um, legal fine point, maybe too fine point of elevating a misdemeanor to a felony will really prove vexing to the jury. Um, and I think it looks a lot simpler today than it did yesterday. First, there's no um, suggestion or request by the defense for a so-called lesser included offense instruction, which they could have done. And that might have invited the jury to just um, uh, convict on the misdemeanor, which I think could have played as a victory for Trump, but people who know him say he would never countenance that. Uh, but then second, the whole thing with different kinds of crimes and what's it going to be? I mean, basically, here's what Steinglass said, and he said it again and again. And really, Blanche said very little on his side. So I think we'll know better tomorrow after the instructions, but this version of events might might just come through and remove the big controversy, potential, you know, legal controversy of elevating misdemeanor to felony. What he said is they falsified, that's a misdemeanor, and they falsified in, in order to conceal an illegal campaign contribution. So he just said it flat out, and um, there's one very strong point in, in, the, in favor of that theory, by the way. Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to it as a legal camp, you know, campaign contribution. And remember, they don't have to prove it. They just have to say it was to further it. And so that rather than – it's also the case. I mean, they referred to the possible tax violation. And um, Steinglass did say that apparently uh, Merchant will instruct the jury, you can have a tax violation even if – uh, the government makes money off it or whatever. Um, you know, so possibly this confusing, uh, pick one from category one, two or three, uh, will, will come up. But at least the defense didn't use it as I thought they might have to sort of tangle the jury and the prosecution in knots. And the prosecution's theory for it was pretty clean and consistent. They falsified papers because they wanted to further and conceal an illegal campaign contribution. That's one sentence. It's a pretty easy sentence. And I think if the jury overall adopts that sentence, maybe we're home free in the whole legal um, uh, 
got, you know, potential in Brolio. Okay, so very solid in form, very solid in content too, except he had so much to work with and Blanche had so led with his chin, but I'm, you know, he, he put it out there and Steinglass uh, clobbered it repeatedly. Um, and then a little awesome extra stuff too, including the, you know, important point that anticipating if anybody in the jury is kind of wanting to poo poo the case or, you know, there's so many people out there who might really driving home the importance of the case in sort of moral political terms, not just uh, technical legal terms. Really damn good job. Talk to you later. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.